And we're back. Oh, don't you love that? I've waited my whole life to say that. No, I haven't either, but we're back. Um, we've had some really involved conversations, been a lot of information. I hope you're jotting down notes. Kids, I know you're on for your parents. I get that. That's awesome. But you should also be <clears throat> thinking through some of this, and there's some really good stuff to have. And I think the thing we've learned so far is that there's some great people, there's resources um, available, and putting your team together is huge. And so now we want to talk about adding one more person to that team. And so our theme for this one is, okay, how am I going to pay for this stuff? Uh, I, we got done with uh, Robert Vandermeer, Executive Director of the Idaho Healthcare Association, and he scared us to death at the costs of what's this, what's this costs. Now, so that just leaves for Kurt, Kurt Halderson, and he is the first Vice President Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley. Um, and uh, I think you understand the complexities as well as anyone. You, you live with one of the gals that we were just talking to and she's quite a resource and she helped us understand how you know involved all of this is and Robert helped us to understand there's a significant cost he said that his joke was these are the golden years because it takes gold to you know get us through this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so what we would like to do in the next 50 minutes is um, conversation around how to pay for it and like I said, the, sub, the subtext all, all day has been, well, that depends. So let's jump in. And I, I, in my head, I see some broad categories. This is a broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you can help us and break that down. There's uh, what I consider the private pay, which is us with our assets, our income, um, everything from our investments, retirement account to our house is an asset. Mm -hmm. People forget that mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, we can move some of the risk um, to other entities. Insurance comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about there's a couple different ways to do that. And then we'll end on... Um, there's some governmental benefits, and um, I, will, I will show my prejudice by the time we get there. Those tend not to be the best um, ways to pay for care because um, they don't pay a lot. In some cases, the, the last fallback as well. Yeah, so... And we'll talk about that's clearly... If you make no decisions and no plan, that, that could be your plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for putting on this event. Uh, well, you're welcome. Um, let's jump in. Um, we learned that the cost of care depends. You know, what do you need? Can you get some in home? Yes, you can get some in home. Um, and like, it can be a nurse in your home 24 7 fairly spendy to do that it could be some home care you know non-nursing type stuff that nowadays is gonna run about 50 bucks an hour maybe a little less maybe more but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it's not a bad number to use mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to us how would we prepare for this? What would we use to pay? Um, well, let me do my introduction first. Absolutely. Um, so I've been a financial planner since around 2007, 2008. Um, been actually in financial services for almost 24 years. Uh, before that, I came into finance from healthcare. Oh, so that's right. I, I a, knew that. I was a cardiovascular x-ray tech. Yeah. So we did interventional radiology, cardiology, all kinds of different uh, acute care type things. So it was a very, very different, different shift from healthcare to finance. Interesting, yeah. Um, but it also dealt with a very similar age bracket. Lots of emotion, similar age bracket, uh, and built my practice on planning. So great to have the assets. If you don't have the assets, well, what's the plan? What else can you do? Um, so it is knowing your employer-based plans, the 
the basic budget of, well, if I have these fixed expenses, where's my discretionary money going? And if you don't know where your extra discretionary funds are going, then that's where probably just doing a basic budget would be the first place to start. Knowing your employer plan, your employee-based plan is, is huge. There, there's some great, great tools. Um, there are high deductible sa uh, HSA, so you've got the health savings accounts. Uh, if you can put money in after tax and then have that money come out uh, for either medical expenses or even pay medical premiums, uh, that's a wonderful perk. Um, some of the accounts also give you a little bit of a rate of return while you sit and wait. Um, group long-term care, I'm, I won't touch on specific product, companies or product, but um, group, uh, group long-term care can also be a way to go through and, and fund some of the long-term care. Um, that also provides short-term and long-term disabilities, depending on, on how good the plan is. Uh, so there's different employer slash payroll things that you can, you can look at first. If that's the, the lowest cost way to help you create a savings discipline, start there. That is the easiest place to start. So how do you find out about that? You get to know who your HR person is and quiz them with all kinds of different questions. Um, in depending on uh, an individual's age bracket and income, um, find out what type of uh, perks or benefits the plan offers that you're basically paying for each month through your payroll deductions. If you have group insurance that might be a little bit more expensive, great, do it inside of the group employment plan. Uh, but back to your question, it really is knowing your HR human okay. resource um, people and then really pulling out that good old plan document to find out what benefits I have, but essentially what you're paying for. And, and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Don't feel bad about asking questions. And you're going to hear me say it several times, know what you own. It is your benefit plan, know what you own. Yeah. Now, there are a number of people that are self-employed. They don't have these same options, but is there a corollary for them? For small business owners, you also have those same types of plans. It might be a little bit more expensive if it's a standalone individual. Uh, if there's multiple employees, you pretty quickly qualify for group rates. Um, the benefit of being that standalone employee and having your own plan is it's portable. So you might have a business deduction because it is an employee expense. Uh, but that would also be portable if, meaning that once you terminate your job or sell your business, it's still your policy. So it should move with you wherever you go. Again, know what you own. Mm -hmm. Ask mm -hmm. the questions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, part of what we're doing here is helping people to know, one, to ask the question and what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So what questions should they be asking? I will have folks come in that are dealing with family events. So they're in the throes of having to help raise a parent, uh, and either that's an in-home care, uh, it might be transitioning to assisted living or full-skilled facility care. Uh, so it really depends on their situation. They're going, it depends. Um, in some cases, that life event is an eye-opener because yeah. now all of a sudden they're the, care they're the child, but they're also the potential caregiver. And if there are enough funds available, either through their income or other assets, it's like, okay, well, this is your aha moment of now put yourself in your parent's situation of they don't have care, it, meaning they, they don't have a long-term care policy. They don't have the assets. So something, uh, we have to find some help somehow, and it tends to fall back on the, that oldest daughter, daughter-in-law, um, and they, they learn very quickly that it is the financial, emotional, and a physical impact of having to be that caregiver. So that's, that's where they, they have that moment of, now I'm raising parents and I know how challenging this can be. What can I do? So that's where I, I had them come in the office because in a way I'm working with their parents to start with. Uh, this is my chance to, to work with the next generation of, okay, well, you're having a life event. Yeah. Learn from it. Take that and create your savings discipline Let's do some research on different tools available depending on um, your income, your ability to have a savings and, and investment discipline. Because if you go down the insurance path, it isn't a couple of months here, a couple of months there. It, yeah. it is a, a long-term commitment. Yeah. 
Um, with the with the gals that we just talked to, with uh, D and your wife Teresa, we we also concluded that almost anything is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are there concepts that we should understand as we jump into that? When you when we look at a long-term care situation, well, first of all, let's go back to the, the savings discipline. So let's pretend we have somebody that's in their early 50s, they're busy raising parents. Well, right in that 50 age bracket is really where we start looking at early, early on insurance tools. I'm hoping that there's some type of a, a taxable savings account that's liquid and available in worst case scenarios. We have other, maybe an employer-based plan, qualified retirement plan, 401k, 403b, those types of things. Uh, maybe a, a, other insurance policies, um, like an annuity, fixed annuities, variable annuities, things like that. Um, the nugget behind annuities, when they're outside of a, a retirement plan, they're called non-qualified right. annuities. Well, those are tools that can be used based on the changes in the tax code. So just when you get tax code figured out, they change it. Yes. So back in 2012, back when we were both a lot younger, um, the, the Pension Protection Act was created. And what it did is it allowed people to go through and pull money from non-qualified annuities, tax-free, based on some type of a long-term care or a qualified care distribution. So it's coded specifically as a, a, a long-term care withdrawal. By doing so, you can take what typically would be the earnings, taxable earnings from the annuity, you can tap into that tax-free. And, and that's, that's one of the tax code changes, which is a huge benefit for a lot of folks. I, I was going to say, though, that, that, that is sweet. That's a sweet benefit that we had not had previous to that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Now, does that cover just me or me and my spouse? It is going to be specific. You can have an individual annuity. You can have joint annuities. It really depends on how you title it when you first purchase the oh, annuity. No. Okay. Um, but most of the annuities are going to be individual based off of some individual social security number. Got it. So this goes back to the planning ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that 50 mark is a good time to really sit down. I, I suppose you can do it before then, but that tends to be mm -hmm. um, much later, costs are higher, mm -hmm. so returns are not going to be as awesome. Much younger than that, you, 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 we're not aware, so mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not thinking through it quite as you know, pointedly. Uh, so in that 50 range, that is an excellent time to visit with a financial professional and sit down and mm -hmm. look at uh, options in general, but specifically, there's some good options here. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still talking about what I own. We're still talking about my stuff, but this is we've been building this based on a savings mentality. Mm -hmm. We're putting something into a, a, a longer period product mm -hmm. that can, by the way, be very helpful. Again, almost anything is better than nothing. Yes. I mean, this is, we can go to this and, and it will help out. All right, what else? Because that's a great option. If they are not aware of that, they should go ask that question or give you a call. And backtracking a little bit, I think the folks that tend to have those larger annuities, they don't know those benefits, but they, they might be in that 60, 70, 80 age bracket. Okay. Because typically the annuities were the tools created way before good old retirement accounts, IRAs, Roth yeah. IRAs. So they were the preceptor. Uh, tax shelter, yeah. TSAs, tel uh, tax sheltered annuities. That was what a, a retirement plan was built on. Uh, and then all of a sudden we've had these other tax code changes to come up with the other IRS acronyms uh, for retirement accounts. So, um, so planning, so you've got, to, I touched on some of the, the elder planning of some of the tools they have access to or might already have, but knowing what, how to tap into them tax efficiently, that, that's part of the challenge. Yeah. For younger folks, again, going back and using your qualified retirement plans at work, 
knowing your employee benefits inside and out. You really, really have to know what you own and what, what plan you're, um, what you're paying for each month. If you have the ability to go through and add more to your retirement plan, and I'm not talking about, okay, my employer gives me a 3% match, so I'm only putting 3% in my yeah. retirement plan. Good for you, but we can do That's a little, yeah. little bit more. There again, what does your budget show? Uh, do you have that extra discretionary income to put something, pay yourself first a little bit better, do more and more each year, um, and, and give time to, to build that wealth? Uh, it's a miracle of compounding. Yeah. Fund your retirement plans if you have excess. Now we start looking at other Roth type accounts. Um, if long term care is something that, that path that we need to go down, there's the criteria I look at is number one: Are you having? Have you had a life event, and you know what these what right. these policies can do, and or if you don't have some type of insurance, then how expensive it really is. Um, is there longevity in the family? Is there family history where yeah we just didn't really pick our parents really well, and and we we have we're gonna we're gonna we're live going a long issues. time. We're gonna mm-hmm. live a long time. Mm-hmm but not necessarily with a high quality of life. We may need significant help as we go along, Mm -hmm. which is where we're trending to anyway, Mm -hmm. regardless of your genetics and all Mm -hmm. that. We we have the technology that, well, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but we have the technology that Keeps us going, but doesn't necessarily ensure that we have that really high quality of life, meaning we may not be living on our own that whole time. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so we talked about one of the options, of course, and this is probably, well, it, I was trying to remember what Robert said. It was like 95% of the care provided is by unpaid caregivers, meaning the family, Mm -hmm. and that daughter or daughter-in-law quits a fairly well-paying job to provide that care. Correct. Um, And so that's a difficult situation. All right, so planning, um, taking and leveraging some income, right? Mm -hmm. So what you were talking about is retirement. Next at least have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and and I guess that's where the planning comes in. It, it's very, very important to have an idea of what, what here's my fixed cost, here's my other discretionary um, income that, that I don't really have a use for it yet, but maybe I can go through and in my budget look at adding either self-insuring. I need to have a bigger buffer just in case. Yeah. Um, if I am going down the insurance path, then what, how much do I need? How much can I afford to wait before I actually trigger my policy? And then ultimately, how long does that policy need to, to serve me? Um, is it a two year, a three year, five year? And then do I need to have some type of inflation um, rider or benefit that helps build uh, on top of the, the cash that I put into my policy? So I, I'm guessing that most people that you visit with have not had this conversation before they visit with you or, or with the financial advisor. They've not had that conversation. I'm, I'm guessing most of them. Most of them have not. Okay. So you're... Or, or it tends to be real, real crude as far as, okay, I, I have an idea and these are the steps I'm working towards and, and have kind of a crude plan, but I'd really like to see something on paper that I can track cash flow, assets, and will I hit my mark with whatever savings discipline I have. Got it, got it. Now, um, your wife mentioned um, this concept of having a quality of life plan. Is, and, and it seems to me that that fits on the financial side as well as the health and medical side. Is that a conversation you also have with them? It absolutely ties together, yes. Because if I will find that people who have a very, very strong savings discipline while they're working, they have their earnings, they, they have their job, they have their employee benefits, 
they tend not to have this dramatic shift of personality and spending in retirement. Got it. So they, they're saving 120% of their earnings, either retirement plans through work, um, after tax savings, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I, I'm not going to spend 150% of my, my income that I, while I was working in retirement. Yeah. It's usually people spend about 80% of their earnings um, so let, let's say that you you make $100,000. Okay, well, now I'm in retirement. I don't have a commute. I'm not eating lunch at the office every day or out. So maybe I, I don't have that extra fifteen or 20000 of of expenses. expenses. Um, people tend not to go above and beyond spending 120000 or 150000 It's okay, well, they have that savings discipline, and they're Got already it. programmed and trained to, to stick with that, that lifestyle. My wife hates it when I call her cheap. She says, I'm being frugal. I'm just being frugal. Mm -hmm. But So there's not a dramatic shift there. No. Um, do you, this is way out there, just compl compl well, not completely off task, but a little bit. Um, do you find that those folks with that type of discipline, do, do you find that they have discipline in their other areas of their life, meaning, are these the folks that exercise? They, you know, get down to the gym. They're out walking. You know that type of thing. I, I, actually, yes. Okay. I, yes. I, I just wondered they, if that was. They have a very set lifestyle. Okay, and and so they are the folks that probably won't need as much care. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, when they do, they're in a better position to cover the costs of that care cover the cost yes but they're also I, I would say if they're active outgoing they're also going to wear their bodies out well that's true and if good you're point. exercising that much and have a, a pretty good lifestyle a clean clean living yeah. lifestyle uh, it's amazing how that clean lifestyle adds that extra five eight ten years of longevity yeah well if they're alive but the body just doesn't work quite as well yeah. as it used to now all of a sudden I might need a little more assistance in my late 70s, early 80s, or, okay, well, I don't have any problems in my 70s, but given my longevity and how I behaved when I was younger, okay, now I have my life expectancy is 90, 95, 100. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a, a couple of octogenarians for clients. They don't like it. They don't want to be around. But <laughs> anyway, that, and I, I just let them know that, you know, there's somebody... Somebody out there has a sense of humor, and they they want to keep you around. Yeah, evidently, mm -hmm. evidently, maybe till they get it right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke. All right, so when you get to the point, talk to us. Maybe maybe get a little bit more detailed when we talk about um, plans. I used to see the best long term care insurance plans they were the best mm -hmm. those companies have now gone out of business mm -hmm. but they were the best they paid forever priced themselves out of the market they yes. i uh, well the, i it seems to me they did not understand that long-term care is not the same as life insurance and that they had to go back and redo their expectations and you know their algorithms and all that Mm -hmm. But talk to talk to me that now about if we get to that point and we're looking at purchasing, you know, some insurance, uh, shifting the risk, if you will, to mm -hmm. uh, um, some of these these companies. What does that look like? Well, first of all, let's have all of our our after tax savings in place to cover at least six months of of expenses. Okay, so that's the worst case financial planning rule of thumb. You have to cover that first. You funded all of your retirement plans. Your 401k is full, and you're putting 10 to 15 percent in your uh, your 401k. And then, if you have an employer match, even better. Uh, anytime free money gets added, you that's, take that's the a free win. Money, yeah. If we're in an income situation where you have a Roth savings account, great. Try to fund that best as possible. Um, people with wealth tend to want to transfer their wealth, so there are different tools where you can either use life insurance. Um, but not necessarily because I, I, I want to pass this on as a, a legacy benefit. It, it's, it's doable, 
Um, that's something where you can, that's the last tax-free frontier next to a Roth IRA that you can still gift. Yeah. Um, so there are life insurance policies that have accelerated death benefits, meaning that you can take a piece of that cash value or the death benefit, accelerate the death benefit, and take that out as, and pay you yourself for to, long-term care. Got it. Or almost like a, a tax-free pension. Oh, so got it's it. another planning tool where insurance comes in really, really handy. All right, so let's back up. So the traditional policy, you can still get those. Good old whole life policies. Well, I mean traditional long-term care policies. I'll, I'll tweak the term a little bit. We'll call them qualified. Okay. Back in the olden days, they had non-qualified policies, which each state could literally go through, and each company could go through and change the rules uh, for benefits, eliminations, things like that. Got it. Uh, so qualified long-term care, it can either be purchased through a employer-based plan, it can be a standalone individual policy, uh, and there again, what do you have that allows you to keep the premium as low as possible? Yes. So the elimination period is basically the time frame of, yeah. I go on claim on my zero day, I have fulfilled two activities of daily living, it's either food, transfer, toileting, continent, uh, there's yeah. six, you trigger two out of six, it triggers the policy, or at least that's, that's your zero day. Correct. You have to wait anywhere from 30, 60, 90 days, maybe even 180 days, before you, and use your money before that long-term care Got policy is, is triggered and starts reimbursing you. Which, which harkens back to, I've got six months worth of living expenses set aside. Yes. Good help right there. Yep. Okay. And then when you do trigger the policy, you fulfill that waiting period, depending on how long you can wait, depending on your buffer, right. your taxable account buffer, the longer you wait, the lower the overall premium is because the insurance company wants you to share some of that risk. We don't want to just be 10 yeah. days of disability and okay, we start triggering the policy. Right, right, the checks. The other thing to look at is there's, there are two different types of policies. Uh, one is going to be a reimbursement and one is going to be an indemnity. The indemnity product is more expensive because what they're doing is basically saying, you're buying a monthly benefit. Here you go. Here's a checkbook. Here, whatever right. that, whatever you signed up for, you get it up front once you trigger the policy. Reimbursement is just that. When you have an invoice, you send, send it, it to along. submit it. So depending on the, the type of policy, it can affect the premium. Uh, and there again, the inflation rider, if you do have an inflation benefit of a 3%, 5%, is it simple, is it compounding? That also affects the premium. And then ultimately, how much of a benefit per month and for how long? How long, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, back in the olden days, they had these wonderful policies that gave you 5% compounding for life. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen one of those for 20 years. And when I have a client call that's concerned about the premium went up 150 or 500 or whatever, please, just please pay it. Just pay it. Yes. No, no, just... Yes. Yeah, you'll thank me. You, you can't get these anymore. They're such a huge benefit. Yeah. Um, and so, statistically... You and I are going to need care for about 2.2 years because mm -hmm. we're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's just the way. Evidently, that's what I was told. That's part of the code. Um, 3.7 uh, 3, yeah, 3 years for women. So, that, so we probably don't need to buy a forever policy. No. You can't get them anyway, but, but you don't need that now. Mm -hmm we could get a, a three-year term, which historically covers us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you get five years? Can you buy the five years? I believe there's, they still exist. Okay. I don't know that I've seen one for a while. I, I think it was more of a three-year to six-year was, oh, okay. was the time frame. All right. So you can go, you can go to six. Mm -hmm. um, now, the... Argument that I heard so often was, well, listen, I'm putting out on this premium, and it's a high premium, and I'm not going to get that back. My kids aren't going to get that back. I'm just paying that, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. If I don't need the care, it's gone. Well, I, mean, I am not the financial professional, but I would suggest to them that, well, okay, that's 
not all that you're purchasing mm -hmm. is the actual need. Actually, you prefer not to need it. Mm -hmm. And I, I had somebody explain to me, it's like your, like your, um, um, uh, your um, coverage on your house, your, your, your you know, fire coverage. And you don't want to make a claim because that meant the house burned down. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that mm -hmm. just to get your premiums back. Mm -hmm. So that was an argument that I dealt with for a long time. But now you can get premiums back, right? Depending on the product, yes. Yeah. Um, well, essentially, insurance is a transfer of risk. It's an unknown, very, very big potential loss. Right. If you can absorb that, great, self-insure. That now, works. Now, and, and so people understand when we say self-insure... That is, you can absorb that loss. You've got every the, hundred percent of the what loss. What you own will cover that loss. Yes, and you're comfortable with that. You can, you can go to bed at night and sleep well, knowing now I'm covered. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'll take I'll take the risk. Yes. Okay. And from a, a care standpoint, that means that you have that after tax chunk of assets in the bank or an equity line or something that you can draw from and not have to worry about, well, I need to have all my family members gather and rally to care for me, or I need, um, I, I can't, I can afford to have the nurse come in and give me some basically custodial, not necessarily skilled care, um, but custodial care to help me with some activities of daily living. Um, and if I do need to transfer from home to facility, I've got that $6,000 per month in the bank covered, mm. not or, an issue. Or or with my income. Or other guaranteed streams of income. I've got my income, I got retirement, annuity, um, a pension, and what I have, yes. I can cover that. Yes. Okay. Now, um, so when people are going, no, no, I need a return of premium sort of a deal, what does that look like? Now we start venturing into the long-term care slash insurance area. Um, there are companies that offer a life insurance policy. It is designed or bolted on with a long-term care benefit. So essentially you're buying a, long uh, a life insurance policy. If you don't tap into that long-term care rider that's bolted on to the life insurance, um, different example. Let's say we have a half a million dollar life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. You bought it when it was young. You always buy insurance when you're young because it's cheaper that way. Um, as we get older, we don't always qualify for the underwriting, and these types of products have very, very stringent underwriting. Uh, no health issues. We don't want to see anything as far as a medication list, so they really want clean, clean bill of health. So we've bought our, our life insurance policy. We, uh, we passed underwriting. If you have a long-term care event, you can come in and tap some of that accelerated death benefit. Maybe it's 2%, 5%, what, whatever the, the benefit is. But if you, as you alluded to, if you don't use it, then yes, I've paid for a premium for life, but I've also paid a premium for long-term care. If I don't use any of it, everything attached to that death benefit comes back to the, either the individual or, or their estate yeah. or, or beneficiaries, however, however it's, yes. it's listed. So, so that, that's possible, but those are interesting restri restrictions isn't quite the right word. The, the provisions. Uh, underwriting requirements. The requirements are interesting and not everybody's going to fit no. in, in that little peg into that hole. Uh, that's not going to fit mm -hmm. everybody. There are other annuity companies. So life insurance, annuities, long-term care, they're all kind of bundled together. Yeah. Um, there's a company that has a fixed annuity that you're able to go through and also bolt on long-term care. So that, that's another unique one. Um, in fact, there's only one or two com companies in the, uh, the whole industry that does that. And they're great tools for folks that might have inherited annuities or already have mm. an existing annuity where um, if they qualify for, qualify for that long-term care um, bolt on, then you can literally go through and pull in assets from another annuity. It's 1035 exchange. It's not taxable. So you move assets from one annuity to another. Adding this extra feature can give you either a two or a three times long-term care multiple based on the assets that you rolled over. Oh. And wait, there's more. 
because, Wait, that's not all. Because you're changing the structure of the annuity, you might able, you may be able to add a spouse oh. to what used to only be an individual contract. Okay, you guys, now to this, this is a joint listen, product. Kids, you need to listen to this. So those are those are unique ones. Those those are few and far between where those those situations come up. Um, but again, it's somebody that has either had it has an annuity. Right. Uh, they have the asset. It's how do we change that asset to fit a different part of life? I, I don't need this annuity for the variable income. I don't need it for the fixed income, but I can go through and tweak it just a little bit to make it, it fit would, a different need. It would be nice mm -hmm. to have some more coverage for the long-term care. Because mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier, th that, that can be spendy. Mm -hmm. That is, that is, as you were explaining, that's, that's this huge loss. And if it hits, we'll need everything that we can get. Absolutely. So I love that. I love that. So there, this is where the financial planning comes in. Yes. Now you have a retirement plan at work. I have an IRA account. I have an annuity. All this stuff is taxable when it comes out of these that accounts. That's correct. And if your only resource is a, a, a large retire, retirement account or retirement plan, Qualified retirement plan. Everything is going to be exposed to taxes oh, yeah. when you draw that money out for I care. I help people remember that they don't have 500000 sitting in an account. Mm -hmm. Uncle Sam is their partner, yes. and he gets to pull a good chunk of that out. Yes. So, yes. yes. Now, you're saying, okay, instead of sharing it with Uncle Sam... There might be another application. What's, what is the strategy for distributions, not just in retirement, but given a big event, a long-term care event, um, where are we pulling the assets from? What's the source? So now let's go a little further. We've done the planning. We don't have a big retirement account. We don't have a big after-tax account. Yeah. Um, we didn't have enough money to save in our Roth IRAs. Um, we didn't marry into a, a great big chunk of assets, which is some people's plan. My, my wife has explained that I married into the wrong family and I said, ditto. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're just going to have to keep working. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. there's that option yeah. too. Okay. So we don't have all that. That's, that's sweet. Not everybody has that. What else? So you touched on it earlier. Um, some of the biggest assets that people have are their homes. Yeah. Some people want to gift their homes. They're going to live, they're going to die, they're going to transfer that house to whoever the next family wait, member wait, wait, is. Wait, hang on, just so you know, at that point, the house is free. It's not costing them anything to live in that house. It's paid for. Other than taxes and inflation, yes. Uh, well, taxes, inflation, yes. and maintenance, and landscaping, and, you know, um, repairs. Other than that. Other than that. Yes. Yeah, it's free. Free and clear. Yeah. Uh, so no more monthly payments to the bank. Um, it's their asset. They can use that asset a couple different ways. You can either go through and visit with the bank and create a home equity line. Yes. If you live in it, you're owner occupied, it's your asset. You can go through and borrow. Basically, your house is now your bank. Borrow from your yeah. home. However, there's a cost for that. Yeah. Just like pulling money out of retirement accounts. It's, it, it was great when interest rates were close to zero for home equity lines. But now if you're dealing with 7, 8, 10, probably closer to 12% for home equity lines, that's not as cost effective. Yes, it's your asset. It's paid for. However, there, that's the catch. Yeah. You have to pay that, that interest um, uh, debt every, service. Every month, you got to pay on that. Yep. And, and so that comes into play... You know, we, we've had the situation where he needs memory care and she's trying to stay at home and she's still trying to run that budget. And now they've got this added expense. They can't, they can't do both. And someone has told them, you need a home equity line. Mm -hmm. But servicing the debt really puts an added strain on the budget. Yes. That wasn't there before. So we created a, an equity line off of what? The home equity. So how much is your equity line? And then how are you going to pay back not only the interest service, the debt service, but now you also have the principal that you have to pay back at some point. <clears throat> so does that mean we have a death event, a step up in basis, and mom sells the house because dad passed away? Are they both in care? 
Yes. Now they're stuck with the house. They can't sell. Or somewhere in their important documents, they said, I want our family to get this home. We're not going to sell it. Well, that's I have stories. That, that's I when have the, stories. The, you try to qualify people for other services, yeah. and that, that can be a challenge at times. Yeah. Uh, I am not a Medicaid specialist. The state really does not want me talking about Medicaid because there are tools and ways, but that's, I leave that to other professionals. Yeah. And we do. Um, and the caveat, the, one of the first things out of my mouth is you really, really don't want to be in a facility on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. That should be the last resort. Um, uh, there's some things you can do and play with, uh, but you've got to have some other cash to make that work and so does the family come up with that if you've done some planning maybe we got something but again medicaid is um paying about half of what actually less than that now of what private care pays so the facilities cannot have a lot of people on medicaid because mm -hmm. dang it they've got to have a profit or they're not going to be there next year correct and I know that's hard to accept. That's a little bit of denial when we get there, right? Well, yeah, but they shouldn't be charging this much. Well, if you want quality care, they got to make a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I know that our interest rates right now affect this as well. You could, instead of a home equity line, you could look at um, a reverse mortgage. Correct which, um, again, is affected by what we've talked about, but has the added advantage it doesn't need to... We don't need a monthly payment to service the debt. Correct. The, the reverse mortgage is a, a unique tool in... Again, I, I'm not a specialist. I don't, I don't service or uh, place reverse mortgages. Um, there are definitely other people in the industry that can do that. If you hear and you go, I should ask somebody about it, call us. We, we have some folks. There are folks out there. Bankers can help. Yes. Bankers can help. Uh, a reverse mortgage basically allows you to go through and borrow from your home. Yes. Borrows the equity and the value out of your home. Um, it's always better to borrow and be the bank, which is essentially what a reverse, reverse mortgage does. It allows you, the homeowner, to be the bank. Yeah. You have to be at least 65, and the amount that you can borrow is literally based on your zip code. So it's a blend of several different factors, and that's how the, the bank will calculate what will allow you to borrow, interest rate in, for that service, and then ultimately, when something happens, individual passes away and they have one of these reverse mortgages, you're not immediately obligated to then uh, sell your home. You, you have a time buffer. Yeah, and, and a couple of things. Um, um, those things, there was a, there was a pretty, pretty stringent, uh, a round of pretty stringent regulations on those. Mm -hmm. So if you were scared off before, fine. Um, but you could come back and ask now because those things have been addressed. Um, you can't borrow as much as you used to, mm -hmm. um, which is actually to your benefit. Yes. Um, and yes, um, every family asks this, well, did I just turn it over to the bank? And the answer is no. As a rule, the, those, the, the provisions that, that um, the feds came out with there is, uh, almost every time there is a good chunk of equity still, because that was the algo algorithm that they came up with, mm -hmm. there's still quite a bit in there. Now, if you want to sign it over to them, okay, there's something wrong with you, but you can do that. Might be leaving some money on the table. But you are leaving money on the table. Can you refinance and hang on to it? You absolutely can. That's, that's entirely possible. Or you can just outright sell it, pay off that underlying mortgage, and then there's some cash. Is it a lot? Probably not, depending on how long this has gone and all that. But mm -hmm. there's still, you know, some cash in that. So uh, there, there are some options there. 
Um, is, is it a tool for everyone? I would suggest probably not for everyone. No. But... Um, Unique cases. Yes, and I've seen it work well, so I'm one of these people going, well, you really ought to think about it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, my, my kids say that I should get a home equity line. Okay, can I suggest a little education? Mm -hmm. I am not the guy to provide it. We know some folks, so we can mm -hmm. do that. We mm -hmm. can get you connected, but that's not our thing. But that reverse mortgage, we've, we've had it where it was just a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. It just made a huge difference. Okay, so um, wrap it up for me. What did we just talk about? We talked about a lot of stuff. Um, we, we talked about the elders looking for long-term care that probably don't qualify. Um, we need to look at all the other assets available to keep people in their homes as long as possible. Um, you stay healthier, you last longer in home. Uh, if we do need to go- Higher quality higher health, quality folks. Health. Yep. Yeah. And maybe that's family, maybe that's community care of some kind. Um, uh, add one more, if I can, we can sell the dang house. Yes. And use that to fund independent living, assisted living, you know, uh, that type of thing. We can, and I know you run into this, I do. Well, I was saving the house for the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, our experience has been with you folks is pretty consistent. The kids go, I, I don't need to have it. Mm -hmm. Mom, I need you to be safe and comfortable. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. And it would sure be nice if I didn't have to come out of pocket to make it happen. Yes. So you're, please sell a house if that gets us to that situation. So that's just one other option. Mm -hmm. uh, and then stepping back to the next generation that might be helping the parents, look at all of your options within your employer-based yes. retirement plans. Uh, health uh, medical plans. If you're a small business owner, you have some other options available. Um, again, if it's a business deduction and you can create your own care plan, uh, why not? That's, that's huge. Um, so depending on where people are in life, if they're close to or in a care need, that's, that's one part of the plan. If you're young, You've been exposed to having to help raise parents and um, and know, and maybe this is more of an industry term than mine, but you know what the financial, the emotional, and the physical impact is of being a caregiver. It takes a serious toll. So why not learn from that, create your savings discipline, and, and have a plan? The other part of that plan is make sure somebody knows what your plan is. Ah, we had that conversation too. Important oh, documents. Oh. Yes. This is where you come in. It's yep. wills, powers of attorney, HIPAAs, all the, all the good stuff. Yep. And then leave some breadcrumbs so somebody knows where to find your documents, what, where to find the plan. And, or, and, or my phone number. Yeah. I would recommend strongly not, not just breadcrumbs. And we're doing better. I, I've seen that change over the years. There was a generation that, no, mm -hmm. we weren't going to know anything. They don't need to know. But we're... Yeah. <laughs> The, the phrase was, pardon the French, uh, it's not French, none of their damn business. That's what we got all of. None of their damn business. They don't need to know that. And mm -hmm. the answer is, yeah, they do. Yeah, they mm -hmm. do. Well, Kurt, thank you for being here. Thank you. That was great information. We could do another hour, I know, but we're out of time. So um, if they wanted to get hold of you, we are going to send out some information, but if they wanted to get hold of you, what's the best way? I think my contact information is attached to the, the presentation. Um, I'm with Morgan Stanley. I've uh, been there for about 24 years. I'm downtown in Boise. And, um, phone, do you want phone numbers or sure. emails? So Kurt.a.halderson at ms.com, unless you really want to spell out Morgan Stanley. Uh, phone oh, number is 208-338-6909. Very good. Uh, and if I can leave one more little snippet, what I didn't cover was there is a website out there called whatcarecosts.com. Oh, I, I looked at this, yes. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful for looking at overall cost, home, facility, all those things. And it's not perfect, but it's a great place to start. Hmm? And then it helps you to ask the right questions. So again, thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank All you. Right.